Today we are lucky enough to have Professor Tim Riker from Brown University coming to talk to you. We were lucky enough to have him as an adjunct here for a very short time, which makes him a great friend of the program. I would like to thank the Multicultural Committee for funding this event. And I guess I should say who I am if you don't know. I'm Sandy Ligren, the Program Director of Deaf Studies. We have planned about an hour talk that's on deaf time, so you've got to be a little flexible, with some Q&A at the end. And when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll sort of talk about the rules of how communication is going to be managed at that time. Okay? Without further ado, welcome, Tim. Thank you, Sandy. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Riker. I'm very happy to be back here at BCC. Thank you so much for inviting me, um, and I appreciate the Multicultural Committee's involvement. It's fun to be back here, but it's sort of like flashbacks, standing in front of this room, being back on campus. I used to teach ASL classes here, including intermediate classes. And to look around, it's just nice to see your faces, and I'm pleased that you all could make it here to listen to my presentation today. Give this one minute to hook in. This is a topic that I'm very excited to present to you. I feel like it's a very important topic for both your hearing world and the deaf world as well. When we think more globally, in general, equality is not accessible to deaf people. So I'm going to talk about how that inequality is generated by other issues around language acquisition and oppression. But first, I should probably tell you a little bit about who I am and my background so that you'll understand the perspective that I'm coming from, and then you'll understand with a greater depth the issues that I'm bringing to the fore today. This is my family. I'm over to your right in the white sweater. My whole family is deaf. I am a second generation deaf person. So I internalize not only my own experience growing up, but my parents as well. And I was very aware of how different our generational experiences were. My brother is also deaf. And his school experience was quite different than mine. So I think that's one of the things that's worth explaining about today. My dad was actually born in Michigan. And he went to school initially. He was born as a hearing person. And then he became ill with rubella as a child. And that's when he lost his hearing. So about three or four years old, he'd become deaf. But he already had acquired some spoken language before he became deaf. Now, of course, his parents were quite surprised and uncertain about how to manage this. And they put him initially in an oral program where there was no sign language allowed in instruction or interaction. So he depended on spoken language and lip reading until he got all the way through high school. And when he tried to imagine what he would do after graduating from high school, he thought about a number of different possible careers, but he struggled. It was very difficult for him to be successful. Eventually, he met some other deaf folks who used sign language, started to find his way into that community, even through written communication as needed, and eventually heard about Gallaudet University, the only liberal arts college for deaf students in the United States. And he decided that was the place for him to go to school. So he sent in his application, and then he found out that he actually had to start with what they used to call the prep year, because he was behind, typically, academically. So there was some remedial work that was required. In the five years that he was at Gallaudet, he did learn to sign, and at about 20, he became fluent. 
Now, interestingly, my mother's experience was completely different. She actually did become deaf as a result of a fever as well. Her family was very poor. They lived on a farm in Georgia. When she became ill, they did not have the resources to pay for different medications and cures, remedies for what was going on for her. They tried what now appear to be crazy ideas like putting my mother in baths of cold water to try to get her hearing back. And eventually, her family discovered the Georgia School for the Deaf. Now, that was about a three or four hour drive from where they lived, so that was disconcerting for them, but they did go ahead and put my mom in that residential school. By the time she was in about middle school, they were really burned out from commuting back and forth, and so they decided to put her in a mainstream setting that was closer to home. And this was really difficult for my mom. She was around people that didn't know sign language. She had moved from an all deaf accessible environment to one that was very difficult for her to access and that was a constant frustration for her. She was always struggling with communication with uh, hearing people as opposed to being in a place where she could access the language. It just happened at one point, she was in a mall and she noticed a bell tone hearing aid store And a number of people actually donated money to try to generate enough money for my mom to be given hearing aids. So interestingly, my parents' different experiences brought me to a whole other perspective. And they had different experiences in terms of education and communication. When it came to me, they decided to put me into the Maryland School for the Deaf. My first language is American Sign Language. So I had exposure to language from birth on, unlike my parents. My very first sign was dirty down there, basically. That's how you translate that, which meant diapers. My diapers are dirty, I don't like it, change them. <laughs> As a first sign, I'm not sure that's the most poetic, but practical, certainly. I was in an all deaf environment when I was growing up at the Maryland School. Everyone was deaf, everybody signed. I was in a very rich social environment to both acquire fluency in language but also academic information. Now my brother, unfortunately, was in a different situation. He had more hearing, so he was actually not allowed to go to the deaf school. He didn't fit their policy or criteria. My parents fought trying to get him into the deaf school because they preferred that he learned and became fluent in a visual language. But oddly enough, he was separated out and put into a mainstream program. So in terms of his academic experience, development of his cultural identity, we were in very different places. So his experience, from my perspective, was much more frustrating. And it's interesting to me that there's that much variety in one family. It's important that you get that sense of the individual story to recognize how many commonalities there are within the deaf community. I also feel like I'm very aware of the privilege that I possess. I feel privileged because my parents were deaf. They used ASL. I was exposed to that language from the time I was born. I was privileged in getting an education in a very high quality school and the education was provided in a language that was accessible to me. In Maryland, the School for the Deaf is in real proximity to Washington DC where Washington <coughs> University is so there's quite a strong deaf community that I could access as well. Not to mention the more obvious parts of privilege. I'm a white straight male. I actually am gay, but people assume that I am straight when they look at me, so that is a privilege I can still take advantage of. So 
Those examples sort of elucidate how there's even privilege within the deaf community and variations in the membership. So some folks have more access to language earlier and they therefore develop more world knowledge. Some folks, deaf people don't learn to sign until much later in their lives. They often have been moved from one school setting to another so often their academic achievement is delayed. So it's worth recognizing the privilege that I had growing up. This picture on your left is my mother holding me and my brother. And I think it's an indicator of the kind of connection that we had because of our shared language. This is a picture of me on the right from the Maryland school. And you can see, I look like a happy kid. I had a rich experience. So today, I want to talk to you a little bit more about language acquisition. You may be aware that there's quite a bit of research and various studies on cultural identities and around ASL language acquisition. So there are studies that often compare sign language and spoken languages. Some research has done, been done on baby sign and the exposure of babies to sign language early on and how that impacts their development. Babies as young as six months old can actually express themselves in simple signs. The children can actually produce signs much, more er much earlier than they can produce spoken language, regardless of their, their hearing status. So oftentimes there's frustration when people don't have the ability to communicate or express their needs. Now because babies exposed to sign language can actually communicate before their hearing counterparts or non-signing counterparts, then typically if they were exposed to sign language earlier, they would actually be ahead of the curve. But hearing children often can't learn to speak and coordinate that set of muscul muscles and production until they're probably five years old. So really, the developmental process is parallel if indeed the deaf child is exposed to sign language early on. Research has shown that that's true. Deaf children from deaf families who are exposed to sign languages early on make similar achievements to those their hearing peers. This is also true of children of deaf parents, whether they're hearing or deaf, if they have ASL to start with in their lives. <coughs> Typically, hearing parents make very quick decisions about when they're supposed to start signing with a deaf child. Deaf parents obviously start right away if they're sign language users. There's a researcher named Lauren Ann Petito. She's from Gallaudet University. And she worked previously at McGill University in Canada. And she did some work studying the brain and how it interacts with language. And what she found is that regardless of whether it's a visual language or an auditory language, the brain processing mechanisms are the same. She actually did research using MRI technology or fMRI technology and found the brain processes language the same way regardless of the channel it's utilizing. It doesn't matter if that language is acquired the same ways regardless of whether it's auditory or visual. There's also research that's been done on people that are highly fluent in ASL 
and any correlation to their fluency in written English. And what they found is that a high fluency in ASL typically does indicate the ability to develop more fluency in written English. And the opposite is also true. So it's very interesting research that's happening now all around language acquisition. One hot topic in our community today is about sign language in general and whether that's a benefit to deaf children. And most researchers in most fields agree, yes, there's certainly a benefit there. Even for children with cochlear implants, there's still a benefit of exposure to sign language. It's true for hard of hearing children as well. Now the people who disagree with that are typically supporting an English only approach to the world. They are often involved in some way with cochlear implants and that industry. There's very little neutrality in this particular topic, I have to say, but there's, there's certainly a conflict of interest for people working in the industry who are trying to assure that ASL is not provided to them. Now, the world is accessible visually with the appropriate language choices. So in a perfect world, a child would be exposed to sign language right away. I mean, within the first few months of their life. If parents or people around that child wait for too long, you could actually miss what's known as the linguistic critical period. That's for language acquisition. That window sort of closes, as it were. Really, that critical period lasts from birth until about six years old, when the brain is just hardwired to acquire language. After six years old, things become more sedentary mentally, and it's much more difficult for people to acquire language. It's slower and harder in the, in the process of acquisition. So the number one risk that impacts deaf children is a lack of exposure to a language they can access. I'd like to give you a short explanation. I, I know that some people like to sort of view deaf people as a group that can benefit from visual input, but they don't hear anything than hard of hearing folks that don't really need sign language because they can sort of access English and therefore use their auditory uh, skills that way. But I would disagree with that. Even hard of hearing folks who may have a reasonable amount of residual hearing would benefit from visual access to information. So oftentimes these two groups are set up as if they're two distinct populations and that's not really true in my experience. Even folks with a good deal of, of residual hearing could benefit from visual language exposure. Even people who have cochlear implants, it's not a normal hearing. It's not like you would hear that and understand. Now there are certainly variations on how much hearing loss different people have. And Sounds like Z, V, H, K, F, S, and TH. Most of those consonants are interior in the mouth. They are not visible on the outside, so they can't be lip read. Vowels more easily can be seen. So if somebody's hard of hearing, they may be missing large chunks of words or letters that make it very difficult to assess what's actually being said. It's just not the same as normal hearing, even with a cochlear implant. And if they have moderate hearing loss to start with, the losses are even greater. So again, ASL is a way to meet a full linguistic need. 
I had planned to show you a demonstration for a cochlear implant, what it sounds like, but unfortunately that technology is not working for us at the moment. But an implant does not sound like what you're hearing right now. Somebody that's experiencing those sounds, as it were, it's, it's a very different experience. There are millions of cochlea in your ear. They are all responding to the implant. There are probably 20 different channels. And some of them are functional, some of them are not. So it's not like what you're hearing now. People who have an implant don't necessarily immediately um, develop the skills to both hear or speak clearly. And of course, education we know is foundation. So what works for deaf kids is bilingual education. In Vietnam, I remember, uh, there's a story about uh, having funding that had come from Japan, provided to Vietnam to set up bilingual programs and expose the children to two different languages. What you notice in this picture here is how participatory these children are. This teacher is standing at the front of the room. She is visually accessible to all of the students. And research has shown that if students have a strong first language and they have visual access, full access, to what's happening in a the classroom, they develop a strong first language and then it is exponentially easier to learn a second language. So written or text-based English. So over and over again, research has shown that strong sign language exposure and fluency actually leads to greater fluency in English. Now we sort of talked about the goods, and we could talk a little bit about the bads. It's going to get a little uglier from here if you can hang in there with me. I know you probably have some questions, and I promise you'll have an opportunity to ask them at the end of the presentation. Feel free to make note of them or keep them in mind. So in general, education has not been provided in an equal way for deaf children. They're often put into mainstream programs where they don't have the same access as their hearing peers. They don't have direct access to their teachers. They have to work through interpreters. Sometimes they don't have an interpreter. So they'll put in um, an itinerant teacher to work one-on-one -on -one with the student. You can imagine that socially the impact that that has. So a deaf student in a mainstream setting is often dealing with big gaps in terms of who they're interacting with and how effective that interaction is. In a deaf environment or a signing environment, then those same students could access all those same events directly. Another issue is many health professionals don't really recognize the needs of deaf students. Many, many hearing parents never learn to sign. And so in a deaf environment or a deaf school, children are actually learning the academic topics. When they're in mainstream settings, typically most of their time is spent on trying to figure out the communication, whether that's lip reading or speech therapy that they get pulled out of the or, or any of those. So really, the focus becomes language acquisition instead of the academic topics. And that has a tremendous impact forever. Despite all the research I just mentioned, this philosophy and approach still continues. There have been some studies that compared students with cochlear implants who were exposed to sign language and used that in the educational system as opposed to those who had implants but were not. The ones that used sign language as well as the technology were able to 
acquire their education much more readily and more successfully. This is called audio verbal therapy. What you see pictured here it is one of the worst inventions ever for deaf education. It encourages children not to use sign. It encourages parents to turn their baby away from them while they speak to them. So they're actually not getting any kind of visual input for the language. It is a 100% barrier. For those who have a little bit of residual hearing, they might be able to get something out of that, but really it's ostensibly brain training. And the, I gotta give you an example of the kind of things they do. So here's a chord, right? They'll flip it like that. Okay, that baby's language deprived. It feels like that kind of gamble. educational system historically has tried to route deaf students into mainstream settings. So there are many deaf schools that are going under. Um, only about 10% of deaf children actually end up in deaf residential schools. And it feels like history repeating itself. And again, this doesn't only apply to profoundly deaf people. This applies to hard of hearing folks too. It, the typical statistic you'll hear is that they graduate from high school with about a third grade reading level. Now I, again, have the privilege of being utterly bilingual, and, but I'm in a very small percentage of the deaf community. If you see these different levels, I'm really in the 8% here that graduated college and actually went to graduate school. I mean, really, that is just the fewest of the few in the community that have that kind of privilege. Only about 30% of deaf students actually graduate from high school with any real fluency in written English. There's often real lack of clarity in their communication and their understanding. They may be able to understand everything in ASL, but they've never had similar access to English and never developed that same kind of fluency. So they may be actually labeled as semi-literate, regardless of their level of fluency in sign language, understand. But they seem to have sort of maxed out in terms of their second language acquisition. Now, you may wonder, how did all this happen? It seems like such a bad idea. I can tell you, here he is, Alexander Graham Bell. He invented the phone, right? He's famous for that, you're aware of that. He also created other technology that oppresses deaf people. You know, we used to use a lot more printed communication than we do, letters, newspapers, etc. Things have changed now. He was a staunch advocate for the oral approach to education. He actually knew sign language, oddly enough. And he thought sign language was a good way to teach children, but he actually lobbied against sign language because in America, everybody spoke English. There were many immigrants moving to the country at that time. <coughs> And at that, in that era, people were very frightened that we would become sort of a tower of Babel, that there would be all these different languages happening at once. So part of his perspective had to do with this English-only movement that was prevalent throughout the country at that time. Unfortunately, that legacy continues today. It, that philosophy continues to oppress deaf children every day in their education. There are many, many organizations and governmental agencies who have invested over the years <coughs> in the use of oral approaches to, to working with deaf children. Deaf schools have typically had to fight and fight to get appropriate funding to stay open. 
you'll notice the Alexander Graham Bell Association up there at the top. That's been in operation since the 1800s. And their message has changed over the years, but their colors have stayed the same. The foundational core beliefs of the association still support an exclusively oral approach to education. So despite how long they've been around, they've never actually opened up to pay attention to the research. They've had to be forced over and over again to try to change their philosophy. And that controversy of oralism versus manualism has been prevalent since that time. You also notice the Oberkoter Foundation here. You know UPS? You used to get those packages you get, the guy in the brown suit that shows up? This used to be that organization. The CEO for that organization is named Paul Obercotter. And his daughter was named Mildred. She was deaf. And she's now involved in the organization, but she really is sort of a puppet in that organization. She doesn't have any actual power. There was a controversy a while ago where UPS, deaf people had applied to become UPS drivers and they were told no, that they couldn't do that. They sued and then ironically this foundation was set up in, in, in response to that lawsuit. There's the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. At one time, deaf children, their children that were born deaf were considered to have a birth defect and really the CDC's goal was to reduce the number of deaf children born and actually it seems like they were successful. Recently I saw an article that talked about how autism is so severely on the rise but deafness is definitely on the decline. And there's been a tremendous push for using governmental funds for the CDC, for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, there's a sub-agency, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. There's funds being given to establish an EHDI, or Early Hearing Intervention Detection. There's been huge investments in that. And before, deaf people really were behind this idea because the, the sense was early detection would mean earlier exposure to language, right? So we would get over some of these educational barriers. But what actually happened is it became sort of a um, factory, essentially, for streamlining people into getting hearing aids, cochlear implants, et cetera. So deaf people's involvement was severely limited at that point. And as advocacy occurred, we were actually pushed out over and over again. So the hearing professionals that were making money <coughs> off selling these technologies, surgeries, interventions, were actually against the continued use of sign language. The last one on the bottom here is the National Center for Hearing Assessment and Management at Utah State University. They got a grant. And there's a gentleman there who has had repeated grants. And he has established a program for AVT. So again, this is back to that idea of no visual access in communication. He's established a special school, uh, basically forcing the state of Utah to create a special category for this group of children. <coughs> and he pretends that there's a lack of bias, but that's obviously not the case. The ultimate agenda is to suppress deaf people's input. So if you really look at these, you can recognize, wow, this is a tremendous system that is established and perpetuating the oppression of deaf people in their language. And when we talk about education, this is vital. 
because it's predictive of people's success in their lives overall in terms of employment, in terms of relationships, and in terms of setting expectations. I mean, the assumption is that spoken language is the only way to go, that sign language is really second class, that deaf people are less than, and if they actually want to succeed in the world with their hearing peers, then they actually have to use spoken language. 40% of deaf people are unemployed. Often, there's no role models or vision for how deaf people can become successful in the world. Mostly through their educational experiences, what they've encountered is barriers. And so the assumption often for deaf folks is that they can't achieve a number of different things. If we have enough time at the end of the presentation, I'll share one story about that kind of barrier in my own personal experience. Uh, we'll hold that for the ending, if there's enough time. You've heard of the glass ceiling, right? So, this happens to deaf people too. You may be able to get a job, but you're not going to get promoted up above a certain level. That's the glass ceiling. So deaf people sometimes do get a job, but oftentimes it does not actually match their qualifications. They're typically very underemployed. Research has found that the money that well, let's see, if a hearing person earns one dollar, or whatever that job is, typically their deaf counterpart will earn half of that, 45 to 50%. There's that, 50 cents, excuse me. There's that big a gap in the earning capabilities of hearing per people versus deaf people. If they want to get a raise, then they have to lobby in a way that their hearing peers rarely have. If they want to set up their own business, they still encounter many barriers in interacting with other organizations or agencies. There was one a restaurant in San Francisco that was deaf owned and that actually was pretty successful, but that's just one example of, of how many deaf people are out there who have not had that same experience. This is an idea that I came up with that helps me illustrate a point I'd like to make. You know, pinball games, right? I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember pinball, but you have the two little squatters that you can control with your right and left hand and shoot the ball up into the playing area, right? So if you think about this as a deaf person trying to navigate the world, and they're sort of bumping their way around like all of us do. If they have internalized a strong fluency in their own language, if they have a sense of themselves as a culturally deaf person, they are often much more resilient. They can bang their way through the system as needed. But if they don't have those foundational skills, it's as if they only have one flapper to use, right? They can't actually come back over and over again. Deaf people often share information with one another. They work hard to provide role modeling for other deaf folks. If that happens, then really that the result is that the deaf person has the control of both of those. They can get through and navigate the world. They can take their knocks but be successful. Without those core sets of skills and identity, it makes it almost impossible for them to be resilient. You may have heard the word autism, and that's essentially could be defined as a system that summarily oppresses a particular group, deaf people in this case. The assumption that basically deaf people are less than because they quote unquote can't hear. So the system, a system that is autist, is actually designed to oppress deaf people. 
But a way to refute that system is to create this kind of foundational resiliency that allows deaf people to function within the system and on a same playing level playing field with their hearing counterparts. So I'm just about finished with my formal presentation, but there is one more discussion that I want to make sure I bring up here today. Some of this is heavy stuff, I know, when we're talking about oppression and struggles. But actually, in comparison to much of the world, deaf people here have much more privilege in the United States. But that's not good enough. We can't be satisfied with just taking care of ourselves. Globally, over 80% of deaf children receive no education at all. So it means they never even step into a classroom. They have no experience of school. They never learn through any formal environment. They may or may not be literate in their language. They may or may not ever learn to count or manage money. But again, if we're looking globally, There's very limited numbers of people who actually have access to schools that use sign languages. I, mean, I, I think probably we're talking one or two percent. So 90-ish, 98-ish percent of deaf people don't have any access to education. So again, in the United States, as dire as the situation is, we're still very privileged. When you think of this one or two percent over the rest of the globe of deaf people that get to access education, that's truly upsetting. And we can't just sit and allow that to happen. I have to use my privilege for good. I have to do my best and my utmost from my place of privilege to make change. And you start small with your local community, but obviously you need to spread out when it comes to these kinds of statistics. All over the world, there are issues of barriers. Lack of access to education, lack of access to captioning. I mean, autism is alive and well in the world. It has many layers of impact on people's lives, oppression, impacts people on many different layers. In some countries, deaf people aren't allowed to drive. In a few countries, deaf people still aren't allowed to vote. Their hearing peers can, but not the deaf ones. I mean, the system at large oppresses the whole community. In some places, when deaf folks fall in love, marry, want to have children, that's forbidden. There are still places in the world that that's true. And that actually wasn't that long ago in this country that it was almost passed legally to disallow deaf people to marry one another. And you know who was behind that? Alexander Graham Bell. Oftentimes, in developing countries, deaf folks living in rural areas are very isolated from one another. So again, no access to education for one another. So what that means in terms of their life is they're typically homebound. They're given work to do, but ultimately unpaid work. They essentially become slaves. They're very isolated. They may have no access. They may have very limited communication, even with their family, just home signs that have been developed for the most rudimentary communication. There's no access to going out into the community, interacting with people, having a job. Those barriers are tremendous. I don't know if you're aware that a number of years ago, in New York City, 
they have found a number of Mexican deaf folks who had been brought to uh, sell ABC cards on the street, peddlers essentially. They were all stuffed into one home. There was a kingpin sort of that had brought all of these people here. And really, their power came from the fact that these folks were from a different country. They didn't have access. They didn't have any sense of their own rights in this country. They couldn't actually communicate effectively with each other, other than to try to pantomime things, draw things out. So they really had no power to advocate for themselves. This is not the first or only time that has happened. You see that I've seen stories about it in France. I've seen stories about it in Africa. Sexual slavery is another issue that comes up. I know there's one specific person in Tanzania, a woodman. She was murdered, and when they did an investiga investigation, they found that this was a deaf woman who was prostituting herself but she couldn't communicate with a client at one point, and he strangled her. And this is just one example of the people that are overlooked in that world. So this happens all over the world, and it happens to hearing people too, certainly. But deaf folks have less ability to resist, they don't have control of the paddles on their pinball machine. The ball is rolling and they can't stop it. They can't intervene on their own behalf. They don't have the power to do so. And that's a result of the system. It's unfortunate, but I recognize the privilege I have here in America. It's important for all of us to attend to social justice and resolving the inequities in our world. We have to look to ourselves to do that. We have to look back to history. If you look back to missionaries and the movements of churches to go into different countries, different schools, different places, their goal was ultimately to use ASL, yes, but ultimately to convert people. So ASL essentially became the language of the colonizer. So, so certain organizations like the Peace Corps, for example, would go and set up a school and services in another country and then start using ASL to teach the children in those communities. Um, like for example, in Kenya, there was a community there. Um, there was quite a few deaf members in the community. They had started learning ASL. They set up a school and some services and everything for the local people. And they noticed in school that they were teaching ASL, but out in the community, they were using Kenyan Sign Language, and all of a sudden, the two languages started to become a little bit mixed when they were noticing as they were using it in the community. It used to be that way here in the United States as well, a long time ago. Um, the language of the people who invented the hearing people, in other words, was the language order was often adopted by deaf people, and it kind of got the two languages often would get mixed up. So that is, is something that we have in our history, and we're noticing that that's happening still out there in other countries today. And I think we need to be aware of that, and we need to be sensitive to that. Now, in closing, or wrapping up, I guess, um, I think there's some steps that we can actually do to overcome injustice. And I, as I see, I have listed here. I think we have to reform the newborn hearing screening test not just here, but everywhere in the world. We need to focus on early sign language exposure to babies and toddlers before they get to be school age. We don't want to fix the problem or make them different than they are. We just want to give them language so that they can 
successful, in other words, a bilingual sign language education. Um, and exposure, the minute that they're born, if they're identified right away as a deaf baby, then we can start exposing them to language immediately. And that's the one true way to guarantee that that deaf person is going to you know, it's going to be successful. It's not going to be a chance or flip of the coin. They will be successful. <clears throat> we need so sign language planning. We need to improve communication access. We need to encourage, encourage change and develop uh, ASL curriculums or signing curriculums, depending on the country that you live in. We need to have teachers who are trained in ASL who are able to go and teach because there's a huge need for that still today. I think, um, as it says in number four, sign language planning. I think that people's attitude influences other people. And if we have a positive attitude about sign language, then there will be a positive influence. And we'll see more equality and more equality with spoken language. If we develop a corpus, which is like a dictionary, it has you know, science and all kinds of uh, academic vocabularies in there that allows the language to expand and grow and change like every other language should. If we had a census in our country that recognized all the people who officially use American Sign Language or any form of sign language, um, and as far as acquisition goes, I think like. ECC has ASL classes. They're expanding them all the time and the program is going to it. Other universities don't have any such courses. Why not? There's a lot of children of deaf adults. Um, you know, they can hear, but they're from deaf parents and they don't have access to their own language in school. So I think we need to set up and plan better for sign language and how we're going to expose children. I also think we need to improve communication access. We, have, we need interpreters with better training, more qualifications, um, and we need more of them. And I think the last thing we need are employment opportunities. The deaf people, this idea that deaf people can't work or can't do certain things or they can't set up their own businesses is old. It's a myth, and I think we need to throw that out and start giving people the economic and employment opportunities that they deserve. The ADA changed our approach to how we even look at interpreters and how we even request interpreters. I think the power belongs with deaf people and I think that we should pressure the government to maybe have a separate fund. <coughs> if you go for a job interview, you don't have to request an interpreter. I'll bring my interpreter and the job, whoever the job hiring agency would pay for my interpreter it would be understood that that's going to happen. That I would not have to ask every time I wanted to go to an event or a job interview or something special at a special day and time that I may not be able to go to because I couldn't get an interpreter. And when we don't show up at these things, we aren't, we're not as powerful and I think it's time for us to take our power back. So that's the wrap up for my presentation. I know it's been an hour, and I've touched on a lot of topics, and it's a lot of information, but I want to open it up now to um, questions and answers, and Well, we're talking about kids specifically. Mm -hmm. 
really studied um, children who spoke different languages, particularly Spanish, I believe, and found that when there was a real emphasis on a first language for about the first 10 years of a child's life, then teaching a second language was more effective. So what they noticed was if they were teaching two languages at the same time, a first language was never very strongly established. But if they were done separately with a time in between, that there was much more success in the second language. So again, the key is a strong first language, regardless of it, whether it's spoken or visual. I think the benefit of visual language for deaf kids is undeniable. But a strong first language is a requirement for anyone to be successful. And to add a second language. But if the focus is put on sort of the mother tongue, if you will, the family's language of origin, you know, if a Spanish family, Spanish speaking families trying to emphasize English more, the child often has less success in developing a strong first language. So again, that's back to the simultaneous idea. For deaf kids, it's a little bit different because you know, inordinately most of the parents are hearing and don't know sign language. So access often doesn't start early enough and therefore deaf community members have to be brought in and connected to the child. I mean, it's a lot to do, but it's absolutely necessary for their success. Are there other questions? Yes. Thank you so much for speaking. It's been tremendous. Um, I have a question. I used to work in the Eddy system, EHDI, in Rhode Island doing research. And I noticed more and more that even if people were willing to say yes, um, you know, ASL is an option for the deaf children in the study, most of the professionals would say, but we really recommend that the parents let the child figure out what they need. Maybe along the run, they'll figure out that they need English. Maybe they'll figure out that they need ASL. Just try one for a few months and see what you think. Then try another approach. And I always found it to be so um, inappropriate and not based in any theory. Have you come across that as well? You know, in terms of professors really empowering parents to just give, you know, give ASL a try for a few months. And try a normal approach for a few more months. See what your child likes. Have you come across that? I understand the question and, and the, the comment, certainly. I, I guess I look at it this way. Hearing children, when they're born, there is a push to, yeah, allow them to figure things out themselves. They're not forced to do anything, for example, the right to the language, sign language. The school, however, sets the curriculum, they teach English, they teach classes in English, they, all of that is happening. It's already established with the ultimate purpose of making sure that child has language at the foundation to be successful in their future life. Ironically, when we're talking about deaf children, nobody's really encouraging or pushing ASL. They don't have various levels of ASL being taught in their schools. So many of those schools, a deaf child will be placed and they have English classes, but there's never the analogous ASL class. They're not being overtly taught ASL, with the exception of a couple of <coughs> schools. One is the Learning Center in Framingham. They've actually started developing and establishing ASL classes all the way through much higher levels of fluency. And some other schools are copying that idea, but it's not exactly de rigueur. It is not very common out there. And that's ironic to me. Because of the funding behind it, the resources, nothing is being put towards ASL, essentially. There's never enough trained teachers or people truly fluent in the language. The National Association of the Deaf, NAD, actually has tried to double the number of folks that are qualified to teach at college and university levels. That's one of their goals. And it's a huge need 
but it's not yet met. Yeah. Just, just to follow up, what do you think the secret is in terms of getting a hearing parent of a deaf baby or child to really embrace having ASL exposed to their baby? And obviously, they're not going to be full of themselves as a hearing parent. So what do you think the secret is in order for them to welcome in either deaf role models or teachers or educators? What's the secret? I think New Mexico has a particularly famous program that um, matches up deaf adults with deaf kids and includes the parents so that they're sort of a mentoring program as it were, but it provides role modeling and resources for both the child and the parents. And it's exposure to deaf adults that allows the parents to both become more excited about the use of ASL, but also expose the child to a role model. And again, there's the system level as well, right? So there's the individual level where parents are making decisions, but there's the system level where it's about PR, it's about the headlines today, it's about sales, it's about production of various technologies. Those levels in the system have such power that the deaf community and schools who provide ASL don't have sufficient support and resources available to them to match the push from the other side. We have to educate people about how their decisions are and their resources are impacting deaf children and impacting them negatively. We have to correct the myths and misinformation that's out there. There's a real sort of hatred of deaf people. There are some truly extreme views of the deaf community. I mean, there is a community there that utilizes a visual language. But this, all, this goes all the way back to A.G. Bell and his thinking, his rejection of the community idea and the promulgation of his own. When A.G. Bell, when you look at history, um, A.G. Bell was one of the originators of the idea of eugenics, which was an effort to actually eliminate deaf people from the planet. So there's, there's a tremendous history that is being perpetuated here. And it's an ugly history. I know it's not pretty information. I promised you we'd have both the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? And we did. <laughs> That's the ugly part. It's the truth, but it is not good. I just want to comment and add to what Tim was saying in response to Julie for the students in the audience who are ASL students or deaf studies majors that often students of deaf studies stay away from the rehab fields. They stay away from audiology. They stay away from speech and language therapy because you learn early on they're the oppressors and they're the enemy. But if no one who's deaf-minded goes into that field, the field will never change. And so one way we can change is to have hearing allies enter the fields and encourage parents that, along with the cochlear implant, you should be using sign language. Look at this research that shows ASL helps develop the brain of any child. You know, while you use this hearing aid and go to speech therapy, here are some resources on free sign language classes that you can take, or for-profit sign language classes you can take. That, the only way to beat the med medical establishment is to infiltrate it. And so we need students who are willing to go fight that fight in, in that realm because as Tim is saying, that's where the money is and money is power. So I would encourage you not to uh, stay away from those careers if you're interested, um, but be an ally in that field rather than part of the problem. Thank you, Sandy, yes. I am going to be an optical occupational therapist and I find it to be very important to have ASL as part of what I can offer my patients. Um, how would you think it would be the best to reach out to the deaf community to say, hey, there is someone in the hearing community, the hearing medical community, that is willing to help <coughs> and wants 
to let them know that there's somebody there. That's an interesting question. Next week, I'm actually going to a training of for interpreters on allies and working with the deaf community. I'll be providing that um, to interpreters. And I just want to share some statistics with you. About 80% of deaf people, 8%, excuse me, of deaf people graduate from college, right? So their power is extremely limited as a result. And allies do allow us to be a larger group, a more critical mass. But there's still a struggle because what happens is people are spread thin. They're burned out. They've been fighting for a long time. They're tired. Their flippers are weak <laughs> on that pinball machine. So they've, they sort of advocate and allow other people to take on the cause. We need allies for that reason. We're tired. But there are also different kinds of allies. You know, some allies come riding in on their white horse to save the day, right? <laughs> That's one kind. But it's not a great approach, honestly. We are looking for allies that want to work with us, that want to be of support. And at the same time, people have to be very cognizant of their choices, their behaviors, the actions that they take, and how they impact deaf people. So for example, if there's a job open, and there's a deaf person that applies, and a hearing person applies, it may create unfair competition in a way. In a sense, the deaf person may not have had, been starting with an equal playing field. They may not have had the same sort of access that even a sign and hearing person has had. And it's a tough moment, those moments, that when you have to make a choice, but it's important to be aware of your own privilege. You know, oftentimes deaf folks don't have ASL classes like you do, right? They've learned it on the fly, but they don't have that level of education in academic ASL. You may learn all sorts of things about the culture and the community that folks in the community have never overtly been taught. So ally is a very interesting idea, and it's pretty tricky territory. Did I answer your question? I talked for a Yeah, I, I guess um, for those that need, I wouldn't necessarily be riding it on my white horse, per se, but if somebody, you know, breaks an arm, has to go through physical therapy, but then also occupational therapy to be able to do things in their house. Maybe they were in the hospital for a long time and they're deaf. How would they know to reach out or how would I make myself available so they wouldn't have to try so hard to reach out? Well, I know here at BCC requires that you, uh, you're required to go to various deaf events. That's an important part of your education because that's where you'll network. When you start to meet other deaf folks in the community, again, that idea of sharing information comes up. If you've met folks, created relationships with them, done some networking, then your name will naturally arise in the conversation when people are looking for help with OT. But those relationships are a vital part of the, past, the future. But not a half-assed version of it. <laughs> <laughs> half-assed sign language isn't going to help anybody, right? <clears throat> so learning ASL is important. But if you don't have any connection to the community, that's only half the ask. You actually have to connect to the community and create relationships that allow you to become part of that community. Again, linguistically, you are highly privileged. You need to not only learn the language, but also create relationships within the community that lead to more. Something that I've heard before is that with the emergence of social media, 
that this has really expanded communication and um, community for members of the community. What's your response to that? Yes, there's certainly a lot of information sharing and interacting going on technologically. Uh, there's actually a new uh, website, DGM, Deaf Grassroots Movement, where folks are starting to share information. But, well, recently on Labor Day weekend, there was a deaf event in Washington, D.C. and a protest and a lot of people converged around the city. And what I saw was a lot of gaps. There was information that was missing, there were insufficient resources, there was not enough training, so there was a protest. But while the protest was happening, the message was inconsistent. And actually the message <laughs> sort of leaked over and started to be oppressive to some other groups, which was not what we were going to. There was one that was hashtag Hashtag Deaf Lives Matter, right? And I thought, oh man, <laughs> you can't take it from Black Lives Matter and now apply it to Deaf Lives Matter. I mean, it's true, right? Deaf lives do matter. We need to look at our own privilege and be aware of that. And compared to hearing folks, we don't have the same kind of access to information. Um, there are barriers, certainly. There are differences between the communities, similar experiences and very divergent experiences. You know, maybe a, a good image is of a person walking through a forest and being scratched and scarred by branches as they navigate their way through. But if you look through, there's a line of people behind them that don't have to suffer the same scars and scratches because they were there in the first. So we're actually clearing a path for our deaf colleagues as we go through changing the world. Okay, I think it is time to wrap it up. I want to thank you again for you coming, and I hope that you had some real aha moments and maybe we'll view the world a little bit differently than before you came in. Again, I really want to emphasize, I'm one deaf person with one message. I have a lot of privilege, and I know there are a number of different messages out there. I don't want you to misunderstand and think this point of view that I've shared with you is the only one. That's not true. But I'm hoping that I've given you some real food for thought you can work with as you move forward here. Thank you.